All right. So um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to another Tech Talk um, series uh, presentation. And we're excited today to have Dr. Corey Baker as our speaker. He's from the University of Kentucky. And once again, uh, our Tech Talk series is brought to you by the Women in Technology Group, as well as um, BEM, Black Excellence Matters. And this is a collaboration we've been doing for some time this year. And we're excited to bring new and exciting speakers and technologies to our bigger Tektronics audience. Thank you. Um, so we're excited to um, bring all these new technologies from around the country and uh, bring in amazing speakers and researchers who are developing these technologies. Um, and it also our focus here is to um, uh, highlight uh, engineers and researchers in uh, who may be identify as um, underrepresented uh, uh, individuals and in communities, um, which is something the Women in Technology Group and BEM are heavily focused on. We're trying to bring in more um, more underrepresented groups um, into engineering and especially Tektronix. So um, with that, I'm going to hand this over to Amr and uh, take it away. You're on mute, Amr. I was saying give thanks to uh, Women in Technology for collaborating and uh, tag teaming and bring in uh, professionals and uh, scientists to come and talk to uh, engineers in Tektronics. Um, and uh, Keith, if you wanted to say anything uh, to introduce Dr. Baker. Yes, thank you, Amr. Um, my name is Keith Tinsley and the Performance Marketing Group. Uh, it is my pre pleasure to introduce Dr. Baker uh, from University of Kentucky. I had the pleasure of getting to know him earlier today. I find him to be a very exciting and charismatic speaker who's really engaged in some groundbreaking research that's really looking at a, a familiar problem from a very unique angle. So I hope everyone enjoys it as well as I enjoyed my talk I had with him today. Thank you. All right, look forward to it. Thank you. Floors is yours, passing the mic. Dr. Corey. All right, so everyone, a mic check, you can hear me, right? Yes, sir. OK, so heads up, um, this is my first presentation on Teams in presentation mode. I do see one thing where, um, unfortunately, I can't see you all as the audience because of how Teams is set up as opposed to some of the, the other um, apps that do this out there. So if you, um, I'm, I'm assuming there's a raised hand option, feel free to ask me questions during the talk when we're on a particular slide. I do not mind being stopped um, at all. Um, just because it's usually harder to go back to slide X during this discussion. So today, um, I'm going to talk to you about overcoming network intermittency to facilitate remote patient monitoring. And I'll, I'll talk about what I mean by that. Um, throughout the talk, um, and it's beneficial here since we're all uh, via, uh, we're all remote, is I'll have some QR codes to, to help you if you want to see some more information about certain things to jump quickly. And so, for those of you who have iPhones, of course, you probably know that you can open your camera app. And if you tap on one of the QR codes in the picture, it should take you to that particular website. Um, if you're on an Android device or, or other, um, I think some camera apps do it. Or of course, if you're using apps like Snapchat, it should take you to the QR code. So very quickly on here, I have two. And, uh, and, and some of these I'll show again. The one in the middle will take you to my website where you can learn more about the things that um, my research lab, the network reconnaissance lab, and myself work on. Um, the work here that I'll talk about is done by my wonderful students. Um, and I have the pleasure of just being able to take credit for the wonderful things that they do. Right. Um, the other here, for those of you who are iOS users, um, when it comes, I, a lot of the things that we like to research are real world implementations. So one of the things that you can see is an app out called Assuage or As You Age. And I'll talk about what that means in a second. Um, that you can test out on your iOS devices. So this is in beta mode. Um, we actually have it set up for uh, some pilot um, studies that we um, want to do in the field uh, that we just got IRB clearance for. And so uh, if you t if you the QR code to your left, 
If you scan over that one, it'll take you to an app called Test Flight, which will allow you to download the beta version of Assuage, and you get to see some of the things I'm going to talk about today. And if you download it um, and play with it, you probably it might trigger some additional questions um, uh, with the discussion that we're going to have today. So some of the things I'm going to go over, I'm going to talk about remote patient monitoring as we know it, and then uh, some of the issues that come along with it uh, when it comes to doing this in a rural setting. Um, which if you are a wireless person, you probably kind of know which direction I'm going. Uh, and then I'll talk about some of the future work that we have uh, entitled uh, that's related to this, along with some other programming and things that I do when it comes to uh, recruiting students, uh, preparing uh, students in general or underrepresented students when it comes to computer science and uh, engineering in general. So first, remote patient monitoring, as I mentioned, just in case you didn't have an opportunity, if you have, if you're on your computer uh, and you have your iPhone out, if you take your camera out and go over this QR code, this will allow you to talk about, uh, to download an app called Assuage or As You Age. Um, and I'll talk about some of that today. So remote patient monitoring um, as we know it. So many of us are all familiar with remote patient monitoring. Basically when a patient has uh, a device on them, say their cell phone um, or a Fitbit, um, or any additional sensor that they might wear. Typically, if they're at home, you want to think in a non-invasive way. So um, an Apple Watch, uh, 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 Android Watch, or Fitbit or something of that nature. That device collects information, whether it's related to steps, heartbeat, et cetera, and it goes to their mobile phone, and their mobile phone can store that in the internet, right? And so when information is stored, typically from a Fitbit, Apple Watch perspective, uh, people might only just look at their own data and see what their steps are progressing over the day. But when there's some type of ailment or a doctor is trying to um, gather information from a patient, particularly they used to have to do this in a proprietary way of uh, putting uh, expensive sensors on people. But a lot of these sensors that we see now released uh, are able to gather good enough data uh, for it to work. And then, of course, when the information gets back to the doctor, um, the doctors are able to interpret that data in some way and try to modify um, their care that they're giving to that particular patient. Or sometimes they say, hey, you might need to come in for some additional things. And this has been beneficial uh, because many times or before remote patient monitoring, people would have to go into the hospital uh, to get these type of assessments done. Right. So we we know remote patient monitoring in general. But what happens is that um, this is highly dependent on the internet, right? And so you, you're expecting internet to be available uh, to send this information to your doctor. Um, and in cases where internet's not available, uh, patients that uh, could benefit from remote patient monitoring can't, right? Because the data cannot be propagated to their respective doctor or to the hospital or clinicians that need to see this information. So what does this look like for people when they don't have internet? Well, in rural areas, particularly in Appalachian, Kentucky, 58% uh, of the rural settlers um, do not have access to high-speed internet, right? Um, and, and sometimes people might assume that uh, maybe the people out there don't have smart devices, but they actually do. Seven out of 10 of them uh, have smartphone devices, right? And so what many of you might have seen is through the efforts over the years, but there's been extensive rollout of uh, potential 5G fiber um, to basically try to get internet to what they call that last mile, right? But in rural areas in particular, it's very expensive. So here, this is some data from, uh, from 2019, but over $22 billion has been spent just in the Appalachian area um, of Kentucky trying to roll this out, and it's still not available, right? Uh, just because there's a number of things when it does get rolled out to some areas, um, it's too expensive for uh, the community to afford um, or they just can't get it to that actual area. Right. And so there's a number of issues that comes out with being dependent on the Internet. And I'll emphasize that a lot here uh, just because of my research interests. And so when you look at the people that are, are, are the agencies that are trying to fund things like this, you have industry in general, USDA, FCC. Um, they provide uh, incentives and subsidies to try to help fund these things, but there's issues with providing it. In addition, when it comes to the known cellular uh, providers, 
uh, you have to provide the right uh, cost incentive um, for them to be able to find out how to make money in these areas in addition to satellite communication, et cetera. Right, and so um, in particular, to solve this uh, problem, one, I, I mentioned the wireless, but then also to do it properly, you have to uh, properly understand the patient and the caregiver, right? And so um, it's, it's you, one may think it's useful to look at this as a, a computer science or engineering problem, but um, as you all know here at Tektronix, uh, just trying to solve issues from an engineering perspective can yield to bad design, right? Uh, when it comes to user-centered design or co-design, um, it's essential to understand all the entities involved and to essentially develop technology together. And here's where the team that I'm part of comes in called LAUNCH, um, which just stands for the Linking and Amplifying User-Centered Networks Through Connected Health, right? And so here um, you see uh, in the middle, uh, Markey Cancer Center, if you're unfamiliar with Markey, it's one of the uh, 50 NCC in hospitals and um, actually uh, the what I'm going to talk about here a lot is lung cancer and uh, Appalachian Kentucky is the number one place for lung cancer um, in the U.S. right for a number of different things when it comes to coal uh, cigarette smoke etc how the the landscape is set up and so here um, on above the UK healthcare you see Dr. Timothy Mullet who's a thoracic surgeon um, and as actually the, the chair of commission on cancer in American College of Surgeons, right? And so one, me being a CS person is useful to interact with people that are actually doing the cancer treatment and surgery um, on, on, the, on patients, right? And then in addition, you see from, um, from NCI, the National Cancer Institute, which is part of NIH, Dr. Robin uh, Vanderpool, who used to be a professor at, um, at UK um, as well. And then you see you, uh, the FCC, Amgen, UC San Diego, uh, the design lab. Um, and then to the left, you see my research lab and two of my PhD students that are leading these efforts um, after uh, to the left and then uh, at least to the, to the right, right? And so uh, it takes a lot of people involved. These are just uh, the researchers, but then also the patients themselves and learning from them to build the right type of design. So if you wanna learn more about launch, there's a QR code there. They'll take you to the launch website and you'll see some of the things that we do when it comes to ethnography, um, technology and things to build, uh, to do remote patient monitoring um, in an effective way. So symptom management when it comes to cancer patients, right? So um, a few things to point out, uh, cancer patients experience a variety of symptoms, right? And uh, typically what we look at is after surgery. So when they are can't, they're, they have cancer, they have surgery, um, you would like to think that the patient may be cured, but there's a, mu there's a multitude of things that can occur to actually hamper um, the surgery or basically cause them to proceed in the wrong direction when it comes to their health, right? And so you have a number of side effects in the treatment. Uh, these treatments uh, relieve suffering, but then also improves the, um, the rate of uh, quality of life. And quality of life assessments are understanding how uh, the patient uh, may be feeling or how their uh, thoughts are towards um, themselves and their, their families. And that plays a major role, right? Because when you think about uh, food, dehydration, these things can come into play. Um, health is very expensive to have these types of surgeries. Many times people lose jobs or they have to take off work. And so there are a number of things that can factor in that can cause issues. And these patients are systematically asked uh, about their, tox their, toxic their the toxicity of their systems. Um, and then also the severity of the presence of their other systems, whether if they're feeling good or not. So uh, one of the ways to, that this is assessed is by using what's called PROMS, which is patient reported outcomes uh, and measures. And they, there are certain surveys or scales that are typically done via paper that uh, these patients may fill out to try to give an assessment to the doctor of uh, the particular quality, quality of life um, of these patients. And that's where, when it comes to the data standpoint, um, the things that we look at when it comes to remote patient monitoring in combination of sensor data that I mentioned from devices. So opportunistic remote patient monitoring, or let me pause for a second, any questions about that? So I try to go into what remote patient monitoring is, 
uh, what type of sensor data or, or what type of data you can collect through remote patient monitoring. And then now I want to talk about opportunistic remote patient monitoring. So any questions about in general? Okay. So when it comes to opportunistic remote patient monitoring, how can you leverage when internet is not available or essentially intermittent? Well, one way is to consider if you're completely offline, how would you propagate information, right? So the types of data that I'm talking about, if you can, if there's no internet available, how would you send it? Well, one way and a completely uh, delay tolerant way um, is by one, looking at the sensor data. So you, here we have a, per, uh, a patient, Alice, and say she has a number of different sensors that are on her body that I might be measuring. Um, so you can think of this here as an Apple Watch and it's aggregating this data to a device. And then say um, Alice comes in contact with another person who I'll, I'll give some more details on, but this typical person in a, in a medical setting will probably be a caregiver, right? Somebody, a family member that's taking care of this particular patient and that's essentially more mobile, they would uh, pass that information to uh, that device or that person via, uh, I'll use an example, and I like Bluetooth, so here you could think about this as in Bluetooth range. Um, if it's in Bluetooth 5, it could maybe 30 to 100 meters that this information could propagate, right? And so in a completely um, delay tolerant way, you might have some timestamp um, where it's now, they propagate that to the caregiver, and then maybe in an hour later, you have some mobility, uh, they come in contact with some other people who have devices and they forward that information and eventually you would hope that it would get to the doctor, right? Um, and ideally you would say in this setting, if one of those people say Node 3 here had an internet connection, then they can push that to the internet, but in a completely delay tolerant way, you're limited to the people and their devices being able to get this information to the doctor. So to put this in perspective, in Appalachian, Kentucky, in these rural areas that I'm going to talk about, uh, the main hospital that they get serviced at in, in the Appalachian area is the UK Marquee Cancer Center that I mentioned earlier. And many of these people may live two to four hours away um, from this hospital. So thinking about people moving data in this way, um, this, may this may never happen, right? Uh, I'm propagating data this way, just thinking about no internet connectivity. Right, so in reality, um, you want to leverage some type of hybrid network, right? Because these places tend to have uh, intermittent connectivity, meaning that internet can be spotty. So if one of these devices get internet, they can push it straight to the cloud as opposed to waiting it to get near the doctor and say Bluetooth range to disseminate it, right? And so here I'm going to bring, a, I'm going to talk about a few things. If you see this uh, yellow line here, that means internet or cellular connectivity. Uh, when you see this red line here, this means that these devices are not in contact or they may not be in range uh, of each other. And then the blue line means that the information is going to get disseminated um, within the first initial time step that I'm going to talk about. And I'll try to put that in the scope. And then the gray line will be some future time where the information got disseminated from a device to device. So D to D here is the device to device. And I'm going to talk about how this type of uh, hybrid network can work to try to deliver this information just from patient to doctor, not necessarily talking about the other way yet. Right. So here we have an example. Um, if we look at the, the left picture of very similar to the delay tolerant, the pure delay tolerant case where um, say we have some information now, I think most of you are on West Coast time. So say it's 1222. Right. And this data is collected from the patient and say it has some updated heart rate information. And as I mentioned, uh, this patient is in contact with their caregiver and usually the caregiver is more mobile. Um, and what I, what I mean by more, more mobile, the patient is a show with some of the data when their lung cancer patients tend to be 50 or, or older. And when they have surgery, they're, they're not able to leave the house as much, but the caregiver is going to the grocery store going to work, seeing other family members, et cetera, right? And so here um, in this initial time of 1222, um, you could think within an hour window that caregiver may come in contact with the patient, their device automatically collects this information, um, and then they may move around some, right? They may leave the house, they may go to the grocery store. And within this hour time span to the left, 
they're not near the medical hospital at all because you remember I said that's two to four hours away. Um, but the they may come in contact with some other person that has nothing to do with the medical uh, um, or the remote patient monitoring system at all. They're just a person with a cell phone, right? And they're saying they're essentially a participant uh, in helping pro propagate information, but they're not. They don't. They can't see what the data is. So say the caregiver comes in contact, and at this particular uh, hour time span, so I'm saying 12:22 to to 1:22. Uh, the caregiver propagates that to the intermediary node and say for not thinking about routing, they decide to keep it. And as you can see, they're not in contact with the doctor or the or the hospital because I said that they're further away. And so here you have some exchange of information. Um, you see no, um, the only time you see the internet availability, the yellow line is on the medical entity itself, but no device that had that has internet connectivity and the data is currently available, right? And so in some future time, say three hours later, you have some mobility in the network, say the caregiver um, moves around, goes home, um, and they're not necessarily staying with the patient, they're not near the intermediary node anymore, but you basically have some movement. So say in, in this case, the caregiver um, end up driving somewhere near the hospital, near a UK Markey Cancer Center, um, they may be able to deliver the information via Bluetooth to the hospital, um, or uh, or the internet, the intermediary node may come in contact with the doctor, and they can propagate it here. And you see, with some delay, say four hours here, um, you can possibly propagate the information to the doctor, um, and now they can assess it like how they normally would, right? Um, and then, for example, if if, if there was internet connectivity, um, say like for example, when it got to the medical entity itself and the clinician was there and they needed to send it straight to the doctor because the doctor had internet connectivity, it could be delivered there via that um, direction as well, right? So you can see that with some delay, with this hybrid type network, you could start delivering information uh, in rural areas, not with the delays that you would see in a fully connected case, um, but in some way that may be meaningful to the, to the case. So I wanna clarify something here. Sometimes when, when we have these discussions, People think patients, remote patient monitoring, the type of data that's going out needs to be emergency data, meaning that um, we need to detect a heart attack, right? And this is not necessarily the case. If you look at the type of PROMs that I mentioned earlier, the patient reported outcomes and measures, those are not necessarily heart attack emergency data that you need to respond to immediately, but it's updates about what's going on with the quality of life of the particular patient. Any questions about that? Okay, so here from how I showed the path and the example of how this can work, you see that there's some critical entities here, right? Of course, there's the patient themselves. The patient is a primary data generator. They have limited uh, mobility, right? They're not, they can't go around the network as much. Uh, they may routinely uh, visit the hospital. And what do I mean by that? Well, when they're taking these surveys for cancer patients, typically uh, the patient may have to go to the doctor here at UK and some hospitals vary say once every 45 days, right? So when you're thinking about updates, I gave an example of maybe this data propagated within four hours, when normally this information that's collected via a survey, and I'll show you what that survey looks like, typically it ha occurs over 45 days. And you can imagine when you're trying to assess somebody's uh, quality of life, a lot can happen over 45 days, right? And I'll, I'll talk about what, what typically happens and the misses that occur, which ends up providing um, not the best patient care um, because the assessments are not frequent enough, right? And there's a course there in the rural areas that have intermittent, intermittent internet connectivity. And of course you have the caregiver who's a, a transport agent. Basically they can collect data for data. Um, and they can provide updates on the patient and they're highly mobile, way more mobile than the patient themselves. Um, but they also, um, as the example showed, have intermittent connectivity as well. And then uh, you have some sec uh, you have the doctor and the hospital themselves, which are secondary data generators. For an example, I didn't show them uh, sending additional information back to the hospital, but you could think that they assess the information. Um, the the medical entity themselves can be considered stationary just because the doctor may move, but the hospital itself is uh, is uh, stationary. And of course, at hospitals, normally when this fiber or this internet connectivity rolls out, the hospital themselves 
even if they are in rural areas, typically have internet connectivity. Um, and then I mentioned things like grocery stores or things where people may aggregate to where they may run into multiple uh, intermediary nodes, um, and those are called points of interest. So you can imagine that if you can understand and leverage points of interest, um, you can strategically get the information out to more people who may come in contact with uh, with the internet or may be able to deliver the information themselves. All right, uh, Dr. Baker. Sure. Yeah, this is Keith Tinsley. Uh, so this is pretty interesting. So I take it in your work, you're going to there. There may be ability to figure out, given a particular density of potential uh limited internet users how many nodes need to be there to ensure that you get timely reception of data yep yep i'm definitely going to talk about that so okay. actually the slides coming up we'll talk about what these uh areas look like and then what happens with the different sizes of their population and how can you disseminate information um so uh keith i think you i I did show you the presentation, but I think you uh, I think you're right on point with where, where I'm at in the slide. So okay. um, so here, so the question and related to what Keith just asked, what happens when distress information is opportunistically transmitted from uh, cancer patients to their health providers, right? So how do you evaluate these things? Well, one of the problems that you come in, um, many of you do research or, or um, conduct research in the area of wireless communication is if you've seen routing and you're in the area of mobile ad hoc networks or uh, slash monets or delay tolerant networks, which is a, a facet of that, um, you see tons of simulations that don't re uh, relate to real world type of data, right? And so when you try to assess if this can work in this particular case that I outlined, the simulation was basically set up to give uh, false positives, right? Um, it, can it work or it may not work? And so here, um, when I talk about rural areas, I'm going to talk about in particular an assessment on how to create a simulation properly uh, for something you know, for an area like Bath County, which is in Kentucky, right? And so Bath County, um, and particularly Owensville area here out uh, in purple outline in yellow, um, here we look at what's the actual population size, what's the density that Keith alluded to, um, and how can you leverage that? Well, first, uh, this particular area has around 11,000 or let's say 1,200 people, right? They have a density of 41.76 uh, per square miles. Um, and then uh, they have about 50-50 male and female, right? And so when you think about how data gets propagated, who can propagate, you might want to understand other characteristics about the people that's moving around in the network. And remember, I mentioned that when it comes to lung cancer uh, patients, um, many of them are in this age gap of this 50 and above. So here over 65, 16% uh, is about 16%. And then you have some percentage that attended college. And then when you look here, um, when it comes to internet adoption, 40 to 60% have internet connectivity, right? In Owensville. So when you assessing what the actual connectivity when it comes to broadband is, um, you see that patients are have intermittent and some of them are without, right? And so here taking this real data, and in looking at creating real mobility patterns is one of the first things you want to do, right? So if you're unfamiliar, there is a data set called the A2's data set, which you can find different um, cities, counties, and you could say based off, you can understand how many people work there, how mobile they are, and what you can do with that is you can create transition matrices to actually get uh, realistic mobility patterns. So how people behave in these cities when they go to work, how frequently they go to work. So now we have an understanding of the density and then really also how they move and how they will come in contact with other people. So here is taking the initial step of not doing something as simple as a random waypoint, but what is actually happening in these types of communities to say, now I created an environment that I can actually simulate over, right? And so what are, what are some of the, the simulation parameters that we set up in the data that I'm gonna show you once we understand how, um, patients and then patients and people behave in, say, Owensville, Kentucky. Well, when we randomize, um, which you, we all know is important to um, the simulation, we looked at this data over 100 seeds, and we tried to look at what happens over a 24-hour period, right? Um, of uh, Just because if we can 
understand what happens over 24 hours, of course, we can keep multiplying those days to understand weeks, months, years, et cetera, right? And so we looked at the adult population of Owingsville, which is 400. Um, and then we looked at the square miles that we pulled from the data before. And then, of course, um, doing some other things like understanding how many lung cancer patients are actually uh, in Owingsville, Kentucky, or in these rural areas. So when it comes to that population of around 12,000, um, in Owensville, they have around 10 people that actually have uh, lung cancer. So we varied between two or 10 um, to seeing if they're active uh, patients in the network, right? And then when it comes to the destinations, there's one the central destination, which is the hospital itself, which is out um, uh, two to four hours away. And then there are a number of other parameters that we looked at when it comes to um, looking at the population um, and not assuming that the whole population is going to participate in this type of network because you can't force people uh, to participate. And then when it comes to transmission, we looked at, um, like I told you before, my favorite, Bluetooth 5, right? So we're look, looking at um, what Bluetooth range is available and how can we disseminate data rates in range with that of this data. So here we see some results of first to the left graph, looking at the latency and hours over this the simulation parameters that we mentioned. So there's three types of graphs here. One is the DTN, which is the first case that I showed you. Remember delay tolerant networks, this uh, bluish purple one, is when you're fully dependent on no internet connectivity. So just information passing from device to device via Bluetooth, right, in this example. The green is the hybrid network, and then the red here is the cellular network um, based off of the real uh, connectivity that's in Owensville, um, Kentucky. So let's look at the far left graph here, looking at the point one, and we see that when it comes to latency, that um, cellular here had the lowest amount of latency, right? So the red is the lowest bar. So to the left, when it comes to latency, a lower bar is good, right? Um, and then DTN and hybrid for looking at when 10% of the population participated uh, had about the same. So mind you, this is 10% of that, that 1,200, or that 12,000, I'm sorry, uh, population. And then what we look at this is what happens in this when it comes to latency, when more and more, where you can encourage more and more people to participate in helping to propagate this information. So you see we go up for 20%, uh, 40, 50, and that's the 0 0.6, 0 0.7, which is why I'm saying 60 and 70% here. And is of course, as you would anticipate, as you get more and more people participating to the network, the latency for all of them go, goes down, right? But as you would expect, if cellular would have the lowest latency, because when you're fully connected, if you could send data through there, um, it should deliver the fastest. But delivering with the lowest latency is not the only metric to look at here, because remember I said these places are intermittent. You, you want to look at uh, delivery rate correlated with uh, latency. So the graph to the right, if you look at this graph in combination with the left, you get an understanding of how much data is being delivered and at what latency is being delivered at. So let's go look at the 10% the, the case that we mentioned earlier, um, where looking at cellular, even though cellular had the lowest latency, because of the intermittent connectivity and the amount of people not using broadband, when you look at um, the delivery of 10 patient data of 10, you see that uh, it's under 20%, it's about half of that, about 10% of the data is actually being delivered. So 10% of that data is being delivered at the lowest latency, where some of the other, um, the DTN and hybrid methods actually delivered more data, but just at a higher latency, right? And then here, you kind of see we're hitting, uh, um, we're hitting a point of where we start to plateau at around 30 and 40% of population participation. So going into the question Keith asked me, what type of density, when it comes to realistic, do you achieve certain things? Well, here we start seeing around the 30, 40, and 50% mark. We can see that our delivery rate when it comes to the hybrid and DTN starts approaching 100% delivery rate, right? Remember I was talking about this is for 10 patients. Um, and so what you wanna do is look at those 40 and 50%, 30, 40, and 50% um, parts of the right side of the graph, and then look at the respective parts on the left to see their latency. Right, so you, uh, cellular is going up, but it's going up very slow. It did not get near 100%. Even when we get to 100% participation, you still cannot deliver um, all of the data. In fact, you're under 40% of this data 
being propagate or being generated by patients being delivered, but you deliver it at a high latency. So you could think here if they're highly if they're only depending on cellular data and you're able to collect this information, you're not delivering a lot of it, right? Um, uh, else in the case when you only have 30 or 40 percent in this hybrid scenario um, you start seeing that the hybrid um, is performing a lot better and the latency is also better right so leveraging people moving around in their mobility and leveraging cellular connectivity when it's available um, and this is not installing any additional uh, uh, access points right this is just leveraging when internet's available broadband's available and people moving right so you see this hybrid creates uh, some some opportunities um, to leverage to enable remote patient monitoring. Any questions there? Yeah, there, okay. there are some questions in the chat. Uh, sure, I can't see the chat, so feel, if I can, can I can read one out for you. Yeah, Matthew. Um, yeah. yeah, this one's this one's my question. I assume that in this space, data security is more important to users. How do you ensure that patient data cannot be accessed by unwanted people on its journey from patient to healthcare provider? Sure. Um, well, one, um, I don't want to, so security may be more important to the user in this case, or it might not be. So I don't want to, I don't want to say that it is, um, but it may be. I think the assumption in, in many cases when we're looking at data goes nowadays, um, the assumption, that assumption may be true. The, the reason why I say it may not be true, and when it comes to co-design, understanding and asking the patients what are their trade-offs um, when it comes to cancer treatment many patients are go through the surgery and willing to sacrifice how they feel and behave to basically live right and that's that's proven um, and so when you ask the question hey if we can increase the life your livelihood and make you feel better while doing it um, as opposed to security, there probably is some trade-off in there, and I don't know where that trade-off is at. But when it comes to data in, in this particular case, here, I think it brings up the question because I brought up the point of an intermediary node, and I think that's essential. Um, I do have some additional slides when I talk about this data in creating in this real scenario in the app that you, da that you may have downloaded. This data is encrypted, elliptic curve. Patients can't, or intermediary nodes um, will have a lot of trouble trying to decrypt this information. And when they participate, they might not even know that they're carrying it. Um, mm -hmm. But I, that, that is also important. And I definitely, I have additional information. I'll leave out the security parts when it comes to this initial discussion because um, there's a lot of, when it comes to data propagation itself. And then you also look at security. Additional question? Yeah, there's another one from Joshua. Um, Joshua, would you like to ask a question or I can just read it from the chat? Yeah, um, pretty uh, pretty simple question. I was just wondering, like, how large are the data packets um, for this information? And are they large enough that they need to get broken down into sub packets just to get an idea of uh, the network capabilities here with uh, Wi-Fi or I mean Bluetooth 5? Sure, that, I think that's a great question. If you give me three slides, I'll get I'll get to that in more detail. Perfect. Thanks. The, Dr. Baker, one more real quick. So yeah. as a follow on to this work, do you see leveraging hotspot based uh, transmitters and say vehicles in order to aid in delivery of information as well as the onset of all these electrical vehicles and not only just having the receiver, i.e. radio, but now again having Wi-Fi in them as well? Do you see those improving your delivery rates? Yes, of course. Um, they definitely will. Uh, the points of interest is kind of like what well, we say those. Those are hot spots. But then if you look at some of the work that um, that we just had published within the last year, we talk about things like vehicles carrying some of this information. Mm -hmm. um, some work that we plan that we have coming out soon is going to talk about leveraging school buses and other mm -hmm. um, predictive things like buses or uh, regular bu school buses, regular buses, mail trucks, they move on predictive schedules, right? Okay. And so that okay. allows you to uh, intermediary nodes introduce uh, a high level of stochasticity that Incredible. you can't have to deal with, right? Um, so definitely, definitely considering th those are definitely improved. Um, here, I'll go into, because it's going to touch on some of the things, and I know, I know we're at 43. I'm going to try to run through some of the slides and then um, allow time for the Q&A if we, if we can. 
Um, here, when I, so I, I talked about in these simulations varying the, the number of patients, right? And so now looking at the same type of, uh, this, these graphs almost look the same, but the x-axis here, now we're talking about varying the number of patients. So in, in a realistic way, remember I told you there's 10 patients uh, in, uh, in uh, Bath County, particularly Owensville that may have this in the rural area. So what happens when these data generators, right? Because we're only talking about from patient to doctor, um, we vary that number and what's the latency here. So here in the left graph, you see the latency, how it varies between cellular, DTN, and hybrid. Um, the interesting case quickly going through this is the green one, ideally is the one, the hybrid case is the one you wanna leverage, right? Um, either with the, the information that Joshua just asked with vehicles and everything else, or just people in general. And then you see here that uh, the delivery rate uh, remains the highest for um, for the green, but then it has a higher delivery rate and a lower latency, which is what we care about in these scenarios, right? And so what happens when um, you need to design for the patient? Because there's a bunch of things that come up that I, when it comes to security is one of the things, but the natural question also is operating systems, when you talk about Bluetooth, are optimized to allow the user, I mean, to for the end user, meaning that uh, most end users, their first care on their devices, I want the longest battery life so I can, say, play the most games or go on social media on the internet, right? And so many simulations don't take into account of, is the operating system going to allow you to use Bluetooth the way that you want to use it or that you need to use it? Particularly in this case, this could be essential because it's, it's pertaining to a patient's quality of life, right? So 5 million over the age of 65, lack of internet access, these are things we talked about, and some assume that there's a low technology expertise, and so how do you leverage UI, UX design, and co-design to do this? So I was asked a question about data, what types of data are you collecting in these surveys? Alert well, from calendar. Sorry about that. Pay. To, reminding me to do some research. Um, and so here, this is the NCCN distress thermometer. This is not a survey that we made. They use this to uh, measure distress of cancer patients. So the biggest indicator on this paper survey is on this scale to the left, depending on the number that the patient reaches or marks on here, determines what happens next. So if a patient, say, hits a, a point of, on the scale of 8 to 10, they automatically are supposed to go to the emergency room to see their, their physician, right? If they're between a 5 or 7, they may receive a phone call. And then if it's lower, you may take action or you may not, right? The problem is, as I, I mentioned, that this information – uh, is typically done. The survey is typically filled out every 45 days at the UK Markey, uh, Markey Cancer Center. And so if you can minimize this data being delivered, you can understand and even learn when the patient's starting to become distressed and do certain things to offset it. These other questions to the right, you see that they're basically binary questions, right? So we have one scalar value, which is zero to 10 for the distress thermometer, but then these other ones are practical problems, Child care, yes or no. Family problems, yes or no. They're binary information. So when you think about the data being collected off the scale, it's not it's not that big at all, right? When when you want to propagate it via via Bluetooth, you have these binary values and you have the uh, the scale value, and then you package it up. You may not even need to uh, compress it at all, right? Because this is not that big of, of data that's collected on this survey, but it tells the physician a lot. Um, and so now taking that paper survey because technically they still use paper and translating it over to an app is what you see in Assuage, but Assuage is very powerful, right? Assuage is the mobile app that I gave you the QR code for that I said if you have an iOS device you can look at. And in here, when it comes to one, that NCC and distress thermometer, but basically any quality of life survey, we can put in here and place four different UIs over it um, to basically collect data from the patient to get to the doctor. Right. And so one, we do this to understand user preferences, learn their, their, their technical proficiencies, and then also to close the digital divide. Right. But even more importantly is to collect accurate data, because the point of co-design and designing UI, you can design the most beautiful UI. But if the, pa the patient themselves don't understand the questions you're asking or it looks in a way that they can't answer it correctly, then you're going to get inaccurate data, which is going to lead to poor care. Right. And so here we try to collect data accurately. To the right, you see the multiple different UIs of two different ones, our launch and then our NCCN pilot study. And if you click through the app, you can actually change through the different UIs to see how it behaves. So I'll quickly jump through these. Um, one is the original paper, which I didn't show a picture for, but that paper that I showed earlier, um, if you just take a picture of that, then you propagate it. You could think about that as the baseline 
uh, evaluation that you would want to use because that's what patients are most familiar with doing so far, right? Um, in addition, uh, here you might have the standard one, which is takes research kit from um, from Apple and basically puts overlays that um, translates that paper survey into something that you'll see here with the thermometer scale that we saw earlier. Um, it replicates the paper format the most, um, but there's some issues that kind of comes up with this, right? In this format, you see from the left and right, uh, the patient has to navigate and they essentially have to answer every question on there. When the paper uh, version, it allowed them to skip around. They don't necessarily have to check all the boxes or yes or no, right? And so this one, they ha they're basically forced to read out the qu every question and this can exhaust the patient, right? Um, to where they say, all right, I want to complete the survey. We've all seen surveys that's too long where we thought we were willing to answer and then it was like, you know what, I give up. I, it, the survey is asking me too many questions. Right. The next one is the checklist. This attempts to um, address some of the problem. Right. It replicates the paper design and allows the patient to skip around in certain sections. So at the top, you see the heading there um, and they can navigate basically synchronously like how they did on a previous one or they can do asynchronously by skipping around on the headings. The addition, the another one is the advanced one, uh, which the advances has all the UI things that we would expect an iOS device to have. But it may be designed in a way to where um, a, a patient may not be familiar with it. Uh, with the current iOS design, it assumes that the patients understand a lot, how to go back, how to go forward, tap here to mean something, right? So here you see that slider, you see some emojis when I talked about understanding the technical divide, you can introduce things in this UI where you're basically saying, hey, zero to 10, you had, this has a color scheme if you're playing with the app and you can go from red to green to understand it, match emoji to feelings, right? And you can get some understanding with this. And so to, to kind of wrap some of this up and then I'll go into the questions, uh, translating over from the research part, here is a program that I'm running this summer. Uh, it's called the Applied Machine Learning Intensive. Um, it's sponsored by NACME, which is the National Action Council for Minorities in Engineering, and then Google. And so this is going on right now. Actually, the class, uh, the class is going on. I stepped outside of the class to have this talk. And currently here at UK, there's three, uh, we have 17 students, there's three sites. So we have one here, this is a pilot year of 17 students here at UK. Uh, University of Arkansas has 21 students. And then at Morgan State University, a uh, historically black college, um, they have 23, right? And so I have the opportunity of being the lead professor of all the universities. And here students come eight hours a day, five days a week for eight weeks to learn machine learning, right? And it's an intensive program. They're, they're, they, the intense is, 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 um, is there. And here we have students at UK. We have um, students from University of Illinois Champaign, uh, UC Davis. They're all here at UK's campus. Um, and you saw probably some of the pictures scrolling um, of underrepresented students that are going through this program um, to learn machine learning and how to apply it to, to research problems. So uh, these are kind of how you change the, how we're trying to change the game. When you, if you saw the picture scrolling through, you see that all those students um, are underrepresented students. This classroom looks in a way um, that typical universities are not used to seeing. But the average GPA of these students are 3.5, right? At the, at the undergraduate level. And then I mentioned some of the schools that they come from. They're coming from all around the country, some of the top schools, and they're all participating in this program. And of course, this leads to when you design things and programs like this uh, to recruitment opportunities um, of being able to bring in these students. These students, um, many of them never been in Kentucky before, but they're learning about UK. Um, they might know about UK because of UK basketball, which I think most people know about. Um, but then they get to experience the campus. They get to learn from me as a faculty member, other faculty here, and even interact with other graduate students. And then at the same time, get course credit, they're getting upper division CS credit that they could take back to their respective universities. So future work uh, with some of this, I know we're running out of time. Um, some of the questions you asked are listed here. What are some of the implications and limitations? Well, one is architecture. Can, um, can you help improve access to care and the quality of life of patients? Um, and then also prioritization techniques, what information and what data is more important? If a patient is trying to propagate a 10, right, or and somebody's passing data that's a 10, that's probably more important than trying to deliver data that's a three on that scale that I showed earlier. Um, and then how do you, I mentioned pilot studies, but how do you leverage this with the medical community? And then also completely delay tolerant can work, but only 
um, for delayed tolerant type symptoms. So like, say for instance, if you don't have anything that's telling, then you can resort to a DTN case. But of course, if you reach a certain point on the scale, you probably need to get that to the internet as soon as possible, right? Um, there's other things you can leverage here. You can incentivize people to carry some of this information. They still don't need to know what it is, but you can incentivize people um, to want to carry this because I taught, I showed participation in the network. Um, and then of course, as many days, things to do with assessing the data, uh, say using machine learning to basically get the device itself to act as some sort of pseudo doctor, right? The device understands the data that's coming in. It can say, all right, I received, um, you're starting to go up on your distress. Maybe I can send a text to your family member that is known to help reduce your stress. Maybe I can suggest that we call here. I can make certain um, interpretations of the data to act as a pseudo doctor for the patient, right? And then lastly, uh, or I kept seeing lastly, a couple of these things. So how do you go about this? I showed you the app, but there's some things that we have open source. So if you use this QR code, it'll take you to our GitHub lab page where there's things that um, I've created when it comes to the server side, the back end, um, um, uh, application uh, called that using care kit on how to uh, develop apps that can do remote patient monitoring and any type of health app right and this is in the connected case but how do you get started with this so there's some open source things that are out there if you look at and some of you may be familiar with uh, care kit itself um, if you look at their repo um, you'll see that when it comes to the sample app um, particularly that Apple has released if you look at the contributor list with some of the things that we've done I'm the number two contributor, so the number one contributor on there is an uh, engineer from Apple. Number two is me, and then you have other people from Apple that have contributed, right? And that's because with the open source community, some of the things to do this research, um, right, you have to collaborate and do different things. And so I've been privy to, uh, to get a lot of things through their framework, to bring a lot of, to introduce a lot of my own, um, and along with my research lab, and these things are coming together to actually bring these types of things to real world situations. So with that, um, I'll go into questions that I'll, I'll leave off one of the things that I didn't talk about at all, but some of you alluded to with your questions is when it comes to propagating data, there's other research areas and projects that we have in the lab when it comes to what I call creating low cost smart cities, which I have on backup slides. So if any of you ask, all right, in smart city data, not medical, how can you create what's called low cost smart cities? But we can talk about that um, through the Q&A. So questions. Uh, hi, Dr. Baker. First, I want to say uh, thanks for giving this talk. It was very interesting. Um, the question I had was with regards to uh, incentivizing people to participate in the network. Uh, you briefly mentioned it at the end there. I was just curious if your research has included uh, looking at any initiatives to, to incentivize people. I know you're working on mostly on the technical end, but I think we've seen, especially over the past six months, that people can be very hesitant to engage in any sort of thing where they think, I don't know, people could be uh, manipulating them, looking at their data, et cetera. Sure, um, that's definitely true. So some of the things that we're we're beginning to look at, and, uh, and particularly with the Smart City Project, and let me see if I can show something here when it comes to this. So when you look at um when it when when you look at trying to incentivize right so in a smart city case i can set i can tell the story where um so your smart city may look something like this uh where you can leverage say people that typically take buses so uh what happens there is that people that take buses usually end up paying for individual bus rides or they pay for say monthly bus passes right so when you uh, create the right partnerships, one of the incentivization schemes that we're looking at is, well, if you start reducing bus passes for people that deliver certain types of data, or say, for example, um, if somebody takes the bus to work and they typically take a certain path, you can understand that data or that path that they take and say, hey, tomorrow, if you leave an hour earlier and you take this additional path, we'll, we'll give you 40% uh, off your bus pass. And really, you might might be saying from your your data collection side is that there's some sensor data that we haven't collected in a, that we haven't seen uh, data from in a while right so there's a sensor to off in this area of the city and i need to incentivize or uh, and give a, even a higher discount to get somebody to go over there to collect that data for me now from the citizen who's taking a bus standpoint 
they may just think like, hey, I, I just care about um, getting my discount on the bus pass. Um, but in reality, we're trying to leverage them on something that they care about um, to help participate in their uh, I think when it comes to the medical case, and you, you bring up a very valid point, it, it comes to understanding co-design in the right way for your particular scenarios. And when I say co-design, uh, having everybody sit down, whether it's the patient, doctor, facilitators, intermediary nodes, to understand how do you design technology in a way for them? What, what incentives work, work with them, what incentives won't work, right? Um, what security, what needs to be all the way secure, what needs to be partially secure? And that comes out, there's no sure way to do that, but that only comes out through co-design. You have to sit down with these people, you have to ask them questions to understand what they feel is best for them. And then have them participate in the design process itself. When they participate in developing these types of apps and these systems, they feel like they're, they're involved and they have um, some skin in the game, right? So then they, they are more aware and they care about it more. Other questions? Do we have a hard stop before? I mean, I'm fine with going a little bit over. Um, really quick question. Um, sure. Dr. Baker, how are you? Um, so I downloaded the uh, a swatch and so what are we doing here? You're saying there's multiple uh, betas, uh, apps and betas status that you pretty much troubleshooting uh, through the uh, app? No, uh, actually, so this beta, this this beta download, um, part of it is to troubleshoot, but then also um, I mentioned that we have an IRB process. So with the four, the, the I mentioned the four user interfaces through, throughout the end. If you mm -hmm. go into your profile, so if you click on your profile page and go to edit, and right. then go down to the very bottom, you can change the UIs on there. What we're doing with this one, that those UIs are randomized. So if you if you deleted the app and read the, and reinstalled it again, you'll oh. probably get a different UI. Um, and so what we're doing is this is prepared for an actual pilot study that we have coming up in a, in a couple weeks. Okay. And when, when people download the app, we want to get the first thing is to understand how they see the UIs, what's usable, what's not. Um, it probably has some bugs in there, um, but really to start understanding how patients interpret UI. Um, and then that's going to go into the wireless part of if we can get them to use the UI more, we're basically convincing the user to tell the operating system, hey, give this app Bluetooth access, right? Which is the, the incentive, incentivize the user to open the app and keep using the app so the operating system allows us to propagate information, which I alluded to here, but I didn't get a chance to talk about. All right, okay, thanks. Other questions? Um. Well, I think we're um, out of time, and I would like to be respectful of everybody's uh, time here today. And um, thank you so much, Dr. Corey Baker, for um, being with us today and sharing your fascinating research. It's always interesting when engineering and human factors come together and um, how you're solving this really uh, interesting problem and um, just you know making the lives of so many people so much better. So thank you for sharing all of this with us. And um, uh, for all of the attendees, thank you for joining us today. And I hope you learned as much as I did. It was, it was truly fascinating. So until next time for our Tech Talk series, um, I'd like to say goodbye and uh, thank you to all of you. So take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.